by itself. No chance, even with that, because Nancy Pelosi and Barney Franks aren't going to let it out. That's why. They're not going to. And wouldn't it be great if we had a media that would ask them why? That there's over a majority of the House of Representatives who already want it. And yet they won't let it out because they're owned by them. That's why. And who really runs Washington, D.C.? Well, the private bankers. So why would you be surprised if the private bankers keep it from happening? Don't be surprised. It's not going to happen. Should it happen? Well, yeah, but it should be this. When Ron Paul said what it really should be, and that is we should abolish the IRS and the Federal Reserve and replace them with nothing. That's right. But not going to happen. So, so, just so you know, this new organization is people who really know what they're doing, who said they want to join what I'm doing and take it to the 10th power, the solution being the sheriff. So we already have the format. We already have the goals. We already have the plan for 2010, and we're, we've started right now. We want to get this book out to all sheriffs in this country. We still have about $20,000 to raise to get a sheriff every book. We've already done about seven states, and that's just in three and a half months. Seven states where all the sheriffs in that state have the book, okay? So we're going we're gonna to take this to the 10th power. And what we're going to do is we're going to vet 900 sheriffs who are already sheriffs, and we're going to see if they are constitutional sheriffs. If they are not, we're going to run a constitutional candidate against them. And we're going to target those for 2010. We're going to elect 900 constitutional sheriffs across this country. Okay? Now, now so, and if you don't think that will kick Washington, D.C.'s butt, well, just wait, because there's going to be a few that are going to start doing it. And it's already happened. And I kicked their butt at the United States Supreme Court. And then they kicked mine right back. But hey, I'm still standing, and we're still going to fight. And we are going to win this. And again, if we're going to keep this peaceful, we have absolutely got to have the sheriffs on our side and on board. And so again, it's Where's the organic milk guy? It's the milk before the meat. You cannot go in there with chemtrails and conspiracy theories that the sheriffs are going to absolutely not relate to. But you can go in there with the oath of office. And you can go in there with this. And it's a very simple message. And remember, this is all about the KISS philosophy. If we don't keep it simple, stupid, we will lose. OK? Are you shifting your paradigm? Because that's why I came out here, is to shift your paradigm. We can do this. Shift your focus as you shift your paradigm. Now, when I was, when I was elected sheriff, that was really an amazing event. And it evolved over some period of time. And let me tell you how that happened. I started my police career in uh, Provo, Utah, while I was working my way through college. And I was a part-time meter maid, writing a bunch of parking tickets. And I mean, I wrote a bunch. <laughs> and I tried, to, I tried to get in the FBI. My father was a retired FBI agent. He passed away about three, three and a half years ago. But he was a good man. Um, but he was also a company man. And uh, I will tell you that whatever you have heard or believe about J. Edgar Hoover, Regardless of that, after J. Edgar Hoover left the FBI, it just became another Washington, D.C. bureaucracy controlled by the politicians. Before, Hoover controlled the politicians. He kept tabs on them. I think that's about the only thing he did really good. He should have done that. That's what we need the FBI doing. And uh, so uh, I never heard back from the FBI. It didn't work out. I didn't get on. And so I got on full time with Provo Police Department. I. Uh, I went up the ladder really quick. I got promoted really quick to corporal, then sergeant, then detective. Uh, and I really enjoyed it there. Uh, it was a very good department. Uh, but I had an epiphany happen to me. 
And it was right after I worked undercover. And when I worked undercover is when I started learning these things about really the truth about government and the truth about the drug war. And I really started to question things about government and about what law enforcement was doing in general. Uh, and I didn't like what I was seeing. Um, then after, after that year of uh, undercover, and I mean I was totally under, totally under. I didn't go to the police station. I didn't have any contact with the police at all except to meet my liaison officer at a secluded point every now and again so I could turn evidence over to him uh, from, from, my, from the cases I was working. And then um, I was back on patrol, and this was a beautiful day. Uh, fall in Utah can be absolutely amazing. And um, it was about five or six in the evening, and I'm parked at a four-way stop at 600 West, 300 South, right next to Franklin Elementary School. And uh, I'm faced north, and again, I'm just 50, 60 feet from the intersection. And I'm filling out my DAR report, uh, daily activity report. Uh, this was before we were computerized. This is like 1983 or so. And um, I look up, and this lady runs a stop sign right in front of me. And I'm going, what could she be thinking? I'm in a marked unit. I have the, you know, the old red and blue uh, bubble gum lights on top of the car. You know, it's, so you know how dated this was. Um, and I look inside her car, and I see this, like, what's going on to me? It looks like about four or five kids, and it looks like the Tasmanian devil inside the car. It, you know, there's legs flying here, and there's arms flying here, and there's kids' heads here, and, and mom is trying to settle them down. And what I surmise real quickly is that she's having such trouble with the kids is that she just didn't notice the stop sign and went through it. And she looks over at me, and she just throws her arms up in the air and goes, what else could go wrong today? <laughs> and it was, it was a real easy deal because she pulls over immediately. I didn't even have to turn on my red and blue lights. And so I get up to the car, and she already has her license and registration out the window. You know? And so I thought, well, this is another slash mark for my DAR, another ticket. Great. Because she's not even putting up a fight. She doesn't even say, oh, please, Officer Mac, please, please, please. You, know, you probably have a mother with all these kids, and they were fighting, and I couldn't help it. And your wife probably has gone through the same thing. Would you want to give your mother or wife a ticket? And this was another, please. And she's crying. She didn't, and some of you ladies can probably relate to that, I'm, and I know my mother and my wife could, uh, but she didn't, she didn't say anything. She was really depressed, and she's just staring through the steering wheel out the windshield, and her kids are still fighting, and she's completely in a different place. She doesn't care now, and um, so I'm, the ticket book's about this big, and I'm, I'm just signing away. And at the end, I have to sign my name and my serial number, which I'm just completing. And then I pause. And I look down at this lady's dilapidated old car. It couldn't have been worth $350. It was like an old Datsun station wagon. Not Nissan, Datsun. And it was a compact station wagon that, had, that was tan in color and primer gray showing through. And it was pathetic. And I looked down at her snotty-nosed kids. Some of them are settling down now and still crying and, and yelling at mom and stuff. And then I looked at me. And I have to tell you, this was the most penetrating gaze I'd ever experienced in my life. And I asked myself a few questions. I said, Mac, is there anything that you're doing here that's helping this family? Is there anything that you're doing that's making this a better place to live? Is there anything you're doing here that's bringing honor to the badge on your chest? Well, we all knew the answers. It was a resounding no. And now, I'm as depressed as the lady in the car. <laughs> and so I handed her back her license and registration, and I took the ticket and walked away. And the station was about three and a half blocks from there, and I drove back to the station, tore the ticket up in a thousand pieces and threw them in the briefing room trash can. And I've often wondered 
if that lady ever thought I was coming back 